Welcome to Timeless Tales, a series where we'll, where we'll be looking at stories that fascinated people through the generations and that continue to engage us. In this first time of being with you, we'd like to share a little bit about the process of how these stories might be applicable to being in the Bay Area. Um, so I'm your host, Ginny Anderson. And I am her grandson and co-host, Will Allen Duprat. So um, maybe you would like to tell people a little bit about your own work because it's kind of quite special. Sure. Um, so I studied visual storytelling at Brown University, and I'm an advocate for nature. I work for a nonprofit uh, that removes invasive species from islands. As a, I work as a photo editor, so I do a lot of visual storytelling in my own work, and I got a lot of that love for nature and storytelling from my grandmother herself, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. So I came to Stanford and to this area in the 60s, and I came to work at Stanford, and uh, finish up my PhD here and then went into private practice. So I thought it was a big deal to be here at Stanford, but I had no idea of a greater gift that was waiting for me, and that was to be introduced to circling San Francisco Bay and the mountains that surround the bay. So I have been in the mountains in Oregon and Washington, in the Himalayas and the Andes, worked with shamans there. Um, and I, when, I was, uh, when I found myself with a lot of teenagers in high school, I thought I had to start looking for mountains that were closer to home. So I spoke to a group of friends and asked them where they had had the experience of feeling like they were a part of something that was bigger than their separate selves. So we developed a list of 16 places that people described that were um, in some of the mountains that uh, were beyond San Francisco Bay, but primarily around San Francisco Bay. So we set out for probably a year and a half uh, pursuing that quest, and this focus totally changed our lives. So wherever mountains exist in the, in the, on the planet, uh, people start to connect them with representing wisdom. So, but how do you access that wisdom? That's the trick. Hopefully you can help us. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so um, there's an image that was created by David Sutton, who accompanied me one time when I was a, on a journey in the Andes. And the name of this image is the Salkawaiki. So it means wild walkers. And when I see him, I think he is striding out there to reach beyond ordinary reality to see how he can enter, enter the flow of wisdom that's really the mountain wisdom. So sometimes that happens through inspiration, sometimes memories, sometimes dreams, sometimes visionary ideas. So now, here we are in Silicon Valley, it's now com considered, you might say, to be the center for exploration of knowledge. And uh, not too many years ago, this same territory was called the Valley of Heart's Delight. And that, to me, is a much more important representation of why it's wonderful to be in this Bay Area and to be able to have access not only to the technological knowledge, but also to the opportunities to explore the mountains and um, see, see what we can do. Absolutely. And luckily, we have this lovely background to illustrate just uh, how beautiful of a, of a surrounding this is. So um, I think it's quite perfect for it what is. we're doing. That really worked out well. So what we'd like to figure out how to do is to create some kind of common language to partner better between Earth wisdom and Silicon Valley's wisdom. So that's part of what we'll be exploring um, as we go forward. And uh, you know, humanity has had a very, very long time walking the planet. And perception has changed a lot. The first major focus of people's perception was, what's edible? <laughs> or how do I not be eaten? So perception continues to change. And, 
um, I am hoping that maybe this will be some inspiration for people to put down their cell phones and get out and walk. So the internet is, is no small part, but something is lost if there isn't a direct contact with the Earth. Space travel may be coming, but the Bay Area is probably the most beautiful place in the universe. <laughs> so might as well really be here and enjoy it. Well said. Okay. <laughs> So the question, one of the questions is, how do we perceive um, what, what a person is, is drawn to? For instance, you. Now, how, you've spent time with Tilly on an island, and, and maybe you could say a little bit about um, what, do you start out looking for something, or did you, what, how did you start exploring with him? Well, I think that, uh, you know, like, yeah, I have spent a lot of time in nature walking mm -hmm. about and exploring. I'm, I'm very, very lucky to have had a lot of opportunities uh, both at the, our family place in Canada as well as uh, just growing up going to an outdoor summer camp. And I think that for me, there isn't uh, so much of even a, a conscious effort as there is just a, a subconscious um, instinct to... That, or, or just a subconscious connection that something just feels kind of right mm -hmm. when you're out and about, you know, and I, I am guilty as anybody of looking at my phone all day, being on the internet all day, but when I do get out in nature, I feel a kind of a sense of relief. And I think that uh, when, I'm, when I'm working as a photographer, the senses that I try to tune into are the, the patterns of nature, and, and um, I think that's personally something that amazes me about nature is is the uh, how how much it's composed of patterns everywhere, and when I try to look for you know what I try to tune into when I'm maybe taking photographs in nature is something that breaks that pattern, something that stands out and um, really creates a strong impression and a strong memory. Oh, well, that's interesting to think about. Well, lots of times when I have something on my mind, which is pretty much most of the time. Um, I like to pay attention to something that comes up, like uh, maybe a fragment of a song or a poem or something like that. So um, when I'm out and about in the natural world and something like that happens, I nudge it. You know, I keep uh, trying to come back to that prompt in a way until the whole thing unfolds and I see more of the connections and the meaning kind of evolves. So in a way, it, it reminds me of the wandering bards and minstrels that went from community to community. And they were the storytellers that brought current events news and commentary about what's going on in the natural world and so on and so forth. They brought it through stories. And there is um, there's a wonderful book that I ran into that's called Wisdom Sits in Places. And it's a book about the way the, Ata the Apache people use the land itself as a teaching tool. So if a person, a young person, say, is, is going away from the mores of the community, the elders would invite that person out to uh, just sit and have a picnic with them. And while they're there, they tell the story of what happened there so that uh, so they give the land a, a chance to speak to the person without saying, you've done something really stupid this time, <laughs> you've really trans transgressed and we hope you shape up. None of that. It's just soaking up the pleasure of being with the elders and hearing what they have to say and giving uh, the place in nature um, a voice in some way. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to show you today um, what that might mean in terms of uh, being in this mountain area around here and uh, what that would be like today. So at the end of San Francisco Bay, um, there is a mountain, uh, Mount Hamilton, where at the top of the mountain there is an observatory. And hundreds of years ago, the people who lived here Around this mountain, the Ohlone people watched the movement of the stars and the planets from this mountain. Mm. So um, Lick Observatory is a sort of Johnny-come-lately. <laughs> <laughs> so um, even when you're, uh, when you're coming into uh, Joseph Grant Park that's at the foot of, of the mountain, 
um, there's something that I like to think of as being hidden in plain sight. So um, when you're parking your car, if you know what you're looking for, you will discover that you've parked your car in the middle of a column, a double column of oak trees that are 500 years old. Wow. Now, most of them are not standing, but a lot of them are, and a lot of them have been replaced. But those oak trees in a column, uh, in a double column, are pointed so that when you stand in the middle of those on a summer solstice or a winter solstice, you'll see the sun rising right there. Wow. So, yeah. So um, it's, it's really exciting to me that you have evidence of their appreciation of the land um, being able to keep them in touch with, uh, with, with the importance of their relationship to the earth. Mm -hmm. Excuse me here. Yeah, and no, I think that also speaks to their understanding of the vast scale of the earth and not only focusing on the oak trees that are very accessible to them and they can see start out as small things, but lining them up with the immense scale of the cosmos in order to line up with, uh, with the solstice, which is exactly. an incredibly impressive feat. Yeah. Exactly. So the story that I'm most interested in sharing with you today is um, uh, happened um, when I was taking a group of people to, to Mount Hamilton at Joseph Grant Park. And the path that we were following led right to a grove of oak trees. And again, just like those, that double column of, of oak trees being hidden in plain sight, the mistletoe in the middle of winter on an oak tree is quite hidden in plain sight. So I flashed on a story that's probably 900 years old. And it's the this, this story about the death of Balder, who is the god of truth and light. So um, maybe before I tell the story, um, we might be able to uh, think a little bit about the relationship of the story of the death of Balder, who is the Norse god of truth and light, to the death that's re recently come to our family with the death of Tilly. Absolutely. Well, I think we'll talk more about that uh, after as we reflect on, on the story as well. But mm -hmm. just to preface, uh, my cousin Talishan and your grandson was uh, killed about a couple months ago in Portland uh, when he was defending several uh, young ladies on a commuter train in Portland and he defended them from a, a racist uh, maniac who ultimately took the life of Talishan and another very brave man and injured a third. Um, and I think that event in uh, my, my life and my grandma's really connected with this story. And so we'll talk more about the connections there uh, afterwards. So, um, yeah. but yeah, that's that's something that we really want to keep in mind for, uh, for this ancient story. Yeah. So the story that I'm telling is 900 years old. At least it was written down 900 years ago. It was probably older than that. But um, this is the story of the Norse god of truth and light. And he was loved by everybody. He had such a good disposition. And he was always kind to people. He always made people feel good about themselves. But something weird was happening. He was having bad dreams of uh, the death of his own death. And so um, he told his father. And his father said, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So he got on his, his eight-legged steed. And he drove to the gates of hell and woke up the person the being who was supposed to be monitoring what was going on there. And she said, it's all over. It's really true. Balder's going to be on his way because we're planning a party, and he is going to be dead for a long time. So, um, so Odin, the chief god who's made this trip, goes back, and he, um, he, says, uh, he tells his, his wife, and, um, you know, like all mothers, they don't want to believe their sons are in big doo-doo. <laughs> and so she goes around and she says, how about it if I make bargains with all the life forms um, and reassure you that that is not going to happen? And she did. She went just all over the place with the trees, the stones, the water, everything. And she made bargain after bargain after bargain. And finally... Bargaining, she, saying, you know, 
excuse me, Mr. Rose Bush, <laughs> would you please promise not to kill my son? Exactly, Balder. exactly. And exactly. so she went to every single life form out there and made the, one such bargain. Exactly. So she went back and she, uh, she told Balder, no problem, it's time for a party. And so in the good Norse tradition, they drank a lot, they uh, pushed each other around, they put Balder in the middle and threw stones at him, and they tested out whether everything was true. And while this was going on, his blind brother was standing at the edge of festivities and, uh, and couldn't be watching, but listening to what was going on. Well, when, when Loki saw that, who's the, the trickster god, he went to uh, Balder's mother and he said, um, did you really talk to everything? He, got, he disguised himself as a, as a friendly old woman. I see. So she felt very comfortable talking, and she said, yes, I went everywhere. I did everything. And he said, really? Like all the stones in the bottom of the river and the mistletoe in the oak tree? And she said, look, the mistletoe is kind of, mistletoe is kind of like the oak's child. So it was hidden and uh, not very visible. And so the oak tree is responsible for that. So yeah, everything is covered. So Loki had everything that he needed and he went to the blind brother and helped him with a mistletoe arrow, arrow, arrow that he had created to aim it at Balder and shot him dead. So, um, so in fact, uh, the, the myth came true, and, um, and he was going to be dead until the end of the world. So um, this really made me think very much about uh, the clues from the story that might be present, and particularly with the mistletoe that was hidden in plain sight that seems pretty relevant to current problems. What are we blind to? How did this political mess happen? What were we not paying attention to? And the other was, the, the second form of blindness was uh, the brother's true blindness. But the mother, the mother saw that uh, the plant as being very insignificant and not really counting. And uh, that turned out not to be true at all. Mm -hmm. so, um, so there they were with, uh, unintended consequences of something that saddened the whole entire community. And so if we ask ourselves, what does that have to do with where we find ourselves now? Um, one of the questions that comes up for me is, what have I been blind to that in any way contributes to the, po to the political mess that we're in? Um, so I thought about, um, about my question about um, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's investments, and I thought, I wonder, I wonder what my retirement portfolio looks like. Big shock. <laughs> Solomon Brothers, or whatever that is. Um, so it, it's just the, the things that we're blind to ourselves yeah. that have some role in what's making things the way they are today mm -hmm. is a, a piece of information that, um, that this story can really help us uh, parse out. And so I've been much more mindful about if I'm paying somebody to work in my yard, am I paying that person a living wage? So how about you? Anything that yeah. occurs to you? Well, so what, what came to mind for me was my own kind of willful blindness uh, to a lot of issues. I think that, I, I don't know, I, I think that a lot of people my age have grown a kind of <coughs> indifference to politics. It's very easy, maybe it's not just a generational thing, but it's very easy to say, oh, politics are boring, politics is just a bunch of old white men making decisions that don't affect my life, but the mm -hmm. fact of the matter is you know, if, it, if I, you know, we, we live in a democracy, it's of the people, by the people, for the people. And if, if we're the people with the power to vote those old white men into office and they're the ones writing a health care bill that's going to leave, you know, thousands, millions of people, you know, uninsured or unable to cope with their, with their medical issues, part of the burden is on me. And 
so that's something that I've tried to to come to terms to to come to terms with um, in in conversation with you yeah. about this story and to try to think of how can I kind of take those blinders off of myself and do more than you know liking a post on Facebook right. or something like that. How can I actually get out there and become more involved? Right, and this you know so this brings up something that I think is really important. There's so much to be done. And I think it's important to pay attention to what you're blind to mm -hmm. and act on something that you have sort of like a personal heart connection yeah. about um, so that you don't feel like you have to respond to every single thing that somebody else is responding. But make it personal. You know, make it be something that's, been, uh, that's related to something you care about. So civilization has been challenged over and over for centuries and centuries and centuries. And I don't think it's any more than it was in the time of Genghis Khan. Um, so there have been lots of times when people have had uh, as big challenges for them as we have challenges for ourselves. Yes, and they can be, and they can be big challenges. I mean, you, you speak of Genghis Khan and, and just, you know, we, there's lots of uh, ancient historical context, I mean, the, the story you told the Balder is an ancient context, and again, t bringing this back to the, the very personal connection that we have with uh, the death of Taliesin, mm -hmm. he, in a sense, I love him, I love him a million, but <laughs> he was blind to the actual danger that he may have been putting himself You're so into, right. yeah. because he, like Balder, had never failed in life, everybody yeah. loved him, and he had handled every single challenge. Well, him, and, most of us don't have that problem. Most of us don't. But Talishan <laughs> was such a successful guy that he saw this racist maniac on a train harassing these young women, and he thought, here's another challenge that I yeah. can take on. And I'm so proud of him for doing it. I'm so proud of him for taking it on. And frankly, I don't see his, you know, maybe we call it blindness, as even a failure because it's led to a lot of dialogue and an outpouring of love from the Portland community, from the Ashland community where he grew up, from communities all over the world. And it's been a really wonderful showing and it's kind of given me a lot of hope that yeah. blindness <laughs> isn't always a detriment, but it is something to be aware of and it's important to, to examine every once in a while, what am I being blind to? I mean, Grandma, I think you've been one mm -hmm. of my strongest role models in life, and, and I think of you as such a wonderful person. But like you said, there were still things in your life that you were blind to. What's in your retirement mm -hmm. portfolio? Are you relying mm -hmm. on companies? You know, there's several uh, degrees removed, perhaps, mm -hmm. but you can, every, every day you can do a little bit more work in examining what yeah. you may be blind to. Well, I want to. I will also, before we end, I want to invite people um, to uh, tell us about places that they've experienced in nature uh, being part of something bigger than your separate selves. So this is not sort of a one person has to solve everything, but it really helps to be able to be connected in some way with places on the natural world that can support and be sort of the foundation of where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. So please, um, if, you, if you have a place that is a place that's been meaningful to you, we invite you to send us uh, information about that and we will try to um, look at, at the place that you're, that you're talking, to, talking about and see if there's a way for us to incorporate that story um, into this series of uh, stories that are going to be continuing to unfold. So um, anything else that you uh, would like to say to um, people that might be with us again? I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I, I th hope that this is the beginning of a very strong dialogue. Um, we're going to be continuing the series talking about more timeless tales as it's called mm -hmm. starting with Balder, I am very pleased of my grandmother and I have Scandinavian ancestry ourselves, so that's one that, that we can be close to. Um, but if you, all, as my grandma said, know of any places uh, that are natural places, such as the mountains around the bay that you've had a personal connection with that make you feel in tune with something greater than yourself, or if you know of any uh, uh, stories, please let right. us know. And, and on screen here, you can see my cousin Talisha, and that's him. And that photo of him hiking there reminds me of 
the the wild walker that you were talking yeah. about. I think yeah, that really that embodies totally his <laughs> spirit. He was always out in nature, hiking, getting in tune. I think that's uh, probably something that made him uh, feel like he could act in that in that situation. And and uh, I think that's true. I think we can all learn something from that. I think you're right. <laughs> So it's really fun to see a picture of Talishan. This is on a bridge that his father uh, built tree houses. And this was a bridge between two tree houses. So, uh, so Talishan spent his life as a wild child in the trees, <laughs> on the ground, <laughs> in many interesting places. And here is a picture that, uh, that my grandson Tyler took of, of Tilly. And it was at, at the... Um, at the island in Canada that uh, Will referred to. Yeah. So thanks so much to Tyler and all the images that he shared, to Will and the stories that you shared, and to the entire staff of MidPen Media. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and I hope it stimulates your thinking. Um, and uh, if I can just take a moment or two um, to encourage you to go out into nature and um, really be purposely present there. So when you go out, put the cell phone away, <laughs> take a couple of deep breaths, let the mountain or wherever it is that you're walking know why you're there, and um, be really fully present. So ask permission of the spot. Um, maybe you could bring some seeds or grains and give a little gift, and open your heart, open your mind. Thank you. Blessed.